You occasionally get crit there's a, an occasional criticism of, of sports data, whatever sport that who who cares? All you need to know is the score. Well, the score tells you who won. You know, what we do is tell you hopefully why they won, and and that brings it to life. I think. Well, I think probably the biggest trend recently is sort of discussion about formations. You know. This week, England, you know, moved to four three three, and everyone's saying, "Oh, that's good." You know, the days of four four two are are gone. I mean, it, actually, if you look this year, four four two, I think, is still the the, the most used formation in the Premier League. Um, but we're able, obviously, to pull out data on on any formation you like. So, I think you know, there was when Liverpool went to five at the back mm -hmm. recently. Um, I had a look, and it, it was remarkably, other than Liverpool's two wins they had, it was you know, this season it's been massively unsuccessful in the Premier League. Pretty much everyone that's played five at the back hasn't won, so you know it, it's been able to sort of pick out trends like that. Really, stats have been always very prevalent in American sports. With the advent of sports coverage on the internet, it's allowed people to have fewer space restrictions in terms of what they put in print and what they put on broadcast, and analyse games in in much more detail. And the stuff that we do here allows fans to see performances of individual players, performances of teams in much more detail and probably most importantly trends across games and across seasons and across leagues as well with the kind of increased popularity of the European game I think and because we cover all of the main leagues in Europe to the same level fans and analysts and the professional game can compare and contrast players across those leagues knowing that they're comparing from the same data sets I think. <laughs>tracking every action as it happens, so every single click on the pitch, every single action that happens on the field, we'll log it into the system, so every pass, every tackle, every every touch of the ball is logged. Um, the idea being I'm doing Man United and Andrew's doing Liverpool, and we track where the player is on the pitch and what they do, so <coughs> just there Berbatov had a flick on, so we'd hit his position in the field, his number, and what he does, so that'd be a flick on lost back here, or West Brown with a clearance that went out of play. So we're just tracking it around the field, so we've got the video coming through the middle here, and we have to look back on when on the pitch it is, what event it is, and which player it is. And we track all the events, around about eight to 900 events per team, so between sort of 1,500 to 2,000 events per match. And, yeah. So if you multiply that, 2,000 events per match times a, se uh, a season times a league, you know, it's millions and millions of bits of data that we collect every season. There's also a sort of quality control element, as Paul touched yeah. on there, as a third Check person who will, will monitor um, this long list of, of the data. No, the third guy, this is the check screen, so this is both the Liverpool and Manchester United events coming through. Um, so he, he just makes sure that everything's in the right order and that we're not no key mistakes. Also, if we're not sure of an event while we're doing it live, when it gets a bit hectic, you can right-click and flag to check, flag to check us out. It'll appear on his screen, and he'll be watching the match on his own. He'll have the match on his own Mac. That's right. The Mac, we can just go back. So if we, if Andrew didn't see a pass there, we can just go back, and it doesn't affect the live footage. So just check that, and you can watch it in slow motion, fast forward, whatever. And you can use this as a good sort of checking tool. And the idea is the third person would use this more often than the actual analysts. Um, so they could actually just check for any events.
and for us as well, I mean, we can do it during the game. So the balls with Rainer now, I could just tap back and make sure that long ball there was, you know, where it was. <laughs> I mean, the key thing to note is that all the data that, that we collect is collected live, so it means yeah. it's available immediately. Um, and everything has an X and Y coordinate, um, which means it can be plotted on the pitch in graphic form. Um, and also it has a time code, so, you know, it's useful for TV production purposes, so you can have, you know, you could bring up every instance of an of a assist by a player throughout the season and have it as a video loop. We have to look where the player has a shot from, where the guard was when he saved it and where the ball was going. Then we have to choose other details like pattern of play, if it was fast break, shot type, if it was a volley, uh, body part, whether it was assisted or not, if it was deflected on the way to the goal, if it hit the woodwork, and velocity, if it's regular or strong or weak, if there was any swerve on the ball, and if it was a direct shot or if it sort of bobbled towards goal and then we make sure we've got the right player to do the assist. It's a key question really, the, the presentation of data, because we collect 2,000 actions per game and, and that's an awful lot of data for people to interpret, especially the people who aren't really, really into their football or into their stats. So finding new and innovative ways to present it is absolutely key to the adoption of it by fans, the adoption of it by media, and us essentially selling more data to all of our different channels. Some things like have happened with iPhone apps, things like the Guardian chalkboards have allowed um, different presentation of data. Uh, newspaper customers like the Times find quite innovative um, ways to do it with infographics and whatnot. So I think that'll develop over time. I think we're at the really early stages of it. But it wouldn't be remotely engaging just to put tables and tables of, of the data. People wouldn't understand it. So the key thing is to pull out what's important, what the data's showing you, and then present it in an engaging way that's appropriate to whichever format you're using. Really. Um, what I'm looking at here is the Opta Query Tool, which is an internal resource um, that basically interrogates our database. Um, the data, as you saw earlier, was, was collected live. Um, that feeds um, a big database, which then um, we can interrogate and come up with, um, with stats and features. And you know, Part of our role, essentially, is to, is to get the data and, uh, and rather than have a, a big, broad sweep of data, but to have come up with sort of pithy, um, succinct bits of information that are suitable for the media or um, football clubs or you know various clients. Um, this allows us to rank anything, so you can rank it by team or player. Um, I'm going to do it by match here, so this is going to look at a match with the most or something. So if we pick something fairly simple like um, shot, so you can obviously you could have just shots on target or off target, but if we choose total shots including blocks there. Um, for the Premier League and for this season, and click build here. Okay, so that brings up a list. That's every game that's been played in the Premier League this season. Um, obviously, you can see there the game with the fewest shots was Newcastle Blackburn, which is 15. Um, at the top, you've obviously got two Blackpool games there. So, Blackpool have been, perhaps unsurprisingly, been involved in the two games with the most shots. Um, that West Ham Blackpool game was obviously 0 0 as well. So, I mean, that's a you know, we noticed that on the day that a there have been a lot of shots, and we were able to quickly run this and, and get that data. You know, to to manually work out the number of shots in each game would obviously be an arduous task, but to you know, it takes sort of five or six seconds with this tool. Um, similar section to the rankings. This is teams. Um, so I've picked up Manchester United here. So this is their current season Premier League. Obviously, they're top at the moment. Um, fairly sort of. You know, standard data. Obviously, we've got more subcategories here. We can uh, you can really look more in depth at, at their record in in the competition. So, if we click all-time record, this is their record against every Premier League team ever since the, since it started in '92. And each of these headings is is clickable. So, if we wanted to look at um, you know average points, so there's obviously teams they've played a few times and won against. We've got three, but if you look here, Wigan they've played 12 times and obviously won 12 games. So again. That's probably you know that we would pick that out as the as the team we've got the best record against. Maybe Stoke as well with six out of six. Um, obviously, at the other end of the scale, you've got Chelsea with 
just 10 wins from 37, so that's 1.19. Um, so Lois and, and you know Arsenal, Liverpool as expected, but then probably less so is Ipswich. So obviously excluding Burnley, that who only had one season, but you know, Ipswich had five seasons, which is probably a, a fair thing. And you know um, they only won half the games against Ipswich. So something for any Ipswich fan to cling on to there. Yeah, I think there has obviously has been a big rise in, in blogging in the last few years and, you know, intelligent blogging as well and it's maybe filled a gap that was, you know, that needed filling and I think it's given certain particularly tactical bloggers, you know, tools like the Guardian Chalkboards have allowed them to, to show that there is a big appetite for, for that level of analysis. Yeah. Um, one of these examples is the Chalkboards and the Guardian, um, which launched two, two and a half seasons ago. Um, it allows the user for any Premier League game they like. Um, you go to guardian.co.uk and then shortboard link. Um, you know, you scroll through the game. You can see there, you know, a few wild efforts. Obviously, getting a bit frustrated that they're two 0 down. Second half begins, still nothing. A bit more pressure, um, even more. And then obviously, Ashwin pulls one back as the first goal in white. Um, more pressure, and then back here. It's very close in, but you can see the second goal goes in there. So, um, as a story of the match, you know, that was West Brom shots, that was Arsenal. So, you know, it's probably fair to say Arsenal did deserve at least a draw from that match. Some of this information you could research in other ways, but obviously, this tool allows us to, to do it really quickly and really easily. Um, and it's that sort of speed uh, of analysis and, and data searching, I suppose, that allows us. Um, to you know, a respond to requests in the media, and also to have things like um, the Twitter accounts, which obviously have been very successful. So. Do you want to have a quick shot of that? That's yeah. essentially our, our weekly, regular work that we have. I mean, that encompasses work for newspapers, for TV, for clubs, for betting organisations. You know, we work with you know any any organisation with um, any sort of interest in data and support. You know, we'll work with. Um. In the professional game, they tend to use it to benchmark players. So different managers and different analysts will have different criteria that they think is important for a particular position on the pitch. So some of them will will rate passing ability, some of them will rate tackling for a midfielder, for example. So how they use it with the young players and the development squads within the club, will, is they'll say um, a Premier League midfielder will be looking at doing this level of activity during a game, he'll be looking at this kind of pass percentage in the final third and all of that kind of thing, and it'll change for this in Champions League games and whatnot, so they'll have something, something to aspire to. If you have a, a current star player's data, um, from say six or seven years ago, you can see what he was like when he was 24, 23. You can then go um, to across Europe, across the world, you know, every league we cover, and find players with similar attributes. And you know, it's, they're not necessarily going to become the same player, but if they're showing that potential at that age, you know, and, and that's the the beauty and the value of the data really is to be able to to spot people. And you know, it's, it's almost like a sort of real life game of of Championship Manager or something. It's uh, you know spot in the gem that's hidden away. Yeah, there's our, some of the professional scouts and analysts that we work with use our stats to measure those trends that I've talked about, but they also need a, an eye on um, the players' performances, whether people are tiring, whether they're lazy, not tracking back, that kind of thing. And the, the type of on-the-ball stats that we measure can't really, can't really tell you that. You, need it, you still need an eye on the game. Also, th things like general technique and attitude and leadership qualities and all of those kind of things that are important in individual and team performances. You can't really glean them from stats. To get the full picture, you'll need the kind of stats that we produce, plus a knowledge of the game and a knowledge of the people in the team, really. sort of trend in that sense in the last year has probably been the rise of Messi and Ronaldo to their prominence is 
I mean, when I grew up, you know, people talked about Dixie Dean getting 60 girls in a season, how, you know, that was, I mean, that just seemed insane to me. Um, but, I mean, those guys are getting, you know, they're, they're not far off, really, and the rate they're scoring at, and, and both of them are also creating as well. So, you know, they're essentially two or three players in one in, in a team, which is, you know, hence their, you know, almost insane value, but they, I would say they're worth it. I think there are different individuals argue about the validity of different types of stats really. I mean, the goalkeeper ones are often quite contentious, whether save percentage is a, is a measure of a good goalkeeper or, or not is, is one that tends to, tends to cause arguments. I think it's, it's down to how the individual interprets them really. I mean, there are, there are players who are, who are kind of often criticised like um, Lucas Lever and Solomon Kalou, whose, whose stats are actually pretty good if you, if you look into them. So I think it just depends on your individual take on the game, really. Yeah, I mean, you can look at sort of chances created uh, per game for fullbacks, and you know, go back six or seven years, and you know, a lot of them, you know, maybe the odd free kick they put in, but you know, now they are being uh, asked to play as auxiliary wingers, and you know, the ones that that can do that are, you know, a at the biggest teams, uh, Danny Alves, Ashley Cole, but you know, they they add something specific and and key to a team. Twitter's enabled Opta as a company to connect with fans really across the globe in a way that we couldn't before. Our, our content, some of the stats that we pull out of the database, worked really, really beautifully in the format in short form. It's very, very sh shareable, highly viral. It's interesting to fans and we can pull stuff out that's contentious, gets people talking. And what it's done is basically just allowed us to reinforce our position as the experts on, on football really. What tends to happen now is we, we have lots of our customers following us, people in the media, people in professional clubs. Sometimes they'll come directly via Twitter as a, as a channel to contact us to, to ask stuff. Uh, it's, it's helped us to build our brand in a, in a way that no other marketing channel has really. favourite Optus stat, it comes from, um, we analysed all of the World Cup games from back from 1966 right up until the, the tournament that's just gone. So we have the biggest World Cup stats database on earth and the, the, the guys in Duncan's team mined that data to find out loads of interesting stuff and the, the best one is that Diego Maradona is the player that's been penalised for the most handballs in World Cup history from 1966 to the present day. But the one obviously that they missed was the one that cost England the quarterfinal. In the picture that. Yeah. Well, the amount of stats I go through, it's hard to pick out one. I think one of my favourite ones last season was um, Wayne Bridge at Manchester City. Made over, I think it was over 40 crosses, about 42, and not a single one reached a teammate. So, you know, that was, and that led to actually someone saying that they uh, had, had seen him complete one, their friend had seen him complete one in the stand, but um, our analysis was, uh, was more accurate.